Hey, Carl, do you remember when we had Dave Kuzinski on the podcast talking about his website, Heads Up Health? Oh, man, that was fun. And what a cool app. Yeah, I like how you can take a data-driven and self-directed approach to your health. Of course you do. You're a geek like me. (laughs) (laughs) Guilty. (laughs) Heads Up Health lets you track your macros, ketones, blood sugar, weight, body measurements, and all that and more. And I like how you can integrate your lab test results for a more complete picture of your health. Yeah, I started connecting my family members and doctors to my profile, and now they're all using it. Yeah, I was able to link it with Strava, which has all my bike ride data, my Fitbit app, my Fitness Pal data, which is my food diary, and it's free. Yeah, just go to headsup.2keto.com and sign up. That's headsup.2keto.com. And tell them the dude sent you. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia. I've been on a ketogenic diet since April of 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in ketosis. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Hey, come to think of it, I can say that I've been thriving for years, almost. I'm almost two years. Yeah, I know. Two years in February. Yeah, nice. Okay, and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah, we're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Mm-mm. <laughs> <laughs> We've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. And where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook and we love to eat. Mm-hmm. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. Absolutely not. So let's start podcast number 83. Lipid Dysregulation with Siobhan Huggins. So, Richard, last week was Daisy's show on Keto Women. Right. But we didn't get a chance to apologize or correct anything from Peter Ballerstedt's show. Do we have any from that? Yeah, I made a few mistakes with regards to explaining genetics, and um, I'll put those uh, in the show notes for that episode. Okay. Let's not go down that rabbit hole now. Yeah, no problem. So let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is. Sure. So a ketogenic diet is less than 20 grams of carbohydrates per day. Yep. Don't eat any sugar or starch. Get all of your carbohydrates from incidental sources like uh, in green leafy vegetables or, yeah, there's a, there's a little bit of carbohydrate in eggs. Yeah. You know, these are nice, nutritious food that are high in fat and high in protein and have very little carbohydrates. So, Yep. Limit the amount of carbohydrate as much as you possibly can. You want to also have enough protein to be able to maintain your body, which is roughly at least one gram of protein per kilogram of lean body mass. Uh, we go probably between one and one and a half grams. You know, mm-hmm. if you need more protein, you can have more, uh, slightly more than that. But if you're uh, type two diabetic, you probably want to get on the bottom end of that scale. Yep. But at least one gram of protein per kilogram of lean body mass is what you require to maintain your body. And then you get all of your energy, not from protein, not from carbohydrates, but from fat. Fat. (laughs) Yes, fat on your plate or fat on your body that you've stored. That's right. Like our ancient Krispy Kreme donut that we keep (laughs) talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, how was your week or two weeks? Yeah, it's been a while, hasn't it? So on Sunday, I did a 45K bike ride and then I started a three-day fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, which sounds pretty extreme, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to lowball my insulin as much as I possibly can. As you know, my fasted insulin is 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 above the level of lipolysis of uh, adipose tissue. So right. at 13.8, you know, 
Um, I'm plateaued, I'm stuck there, but I want to see how far I can get my insulin down when I really pull out all stops. And the yeah. thing is, when when you go on a fast, your body has to lower your insulin uh, mm. to, to give you access to body fat. So if your insulin is above uh, 14-ish, uh, you're, you, uh, a fast, after about 24 hours, your insulin levels will drop to enable you to have some energy. Mm. And so I want to see how far how low I can get that too. Nice. So that's what I'm doing this week. Um, I've also been watching this show, uh, show on, it's a TV show in Australia on SBS, which is called The Obesity Myth. And it's an Australian show about a hospital and a clinic, a weight loss clinic in Melbourne that mm. treat people with ketogenic diets, with hunger suppressants and with weight loss surgeries. And I've just watched the first half of the first show and it's quite disappointing, really, because hmm. the, the ketogenic diet that they put these people on is a meal replacement diet where they replace two meals a day with this thing called OptiFast, which is a low calorie. And it is ketogenic because hmm. it's, you know, it's full of corn oil and it's got, it's a horrible polyunsaturated oils. Oh. Um, it's, it's really a nasty, nasty thing to put people on. Yet when I first became diabetic, I was actually on a doctor's recommended weight loss diet which yeah. was something back then called slim fast and oh, i don't know right. if you've heard of these yeah, yeah. but they're all sugar sugar yep. sugar sugar it's but crazy they're low fat you know and the theory mm. is if you calorie restrict then people will lose weight but the problem of course is in the meal every day that you don't replace with these uh slim fast uh or in this case opti fast meal replacements your hunger just drives you to eat and if you're eating sugar all day then your hunger is going to be out of control yeah, it's working against you. That's how I became. That's how I got pre-diabetic. Eventually, I just couldn't see. So um, that so that was on Slim Fast. This stuff is doesn't have a lot of sugar in it. OptiFast. It's a, a Dietitians Association of Australia recommended uh, meal replacement diet that is essentially ketogenic. And the diet that they have the people eating for the meal that isn't replaced is you know a high protein, moderate fat. No, uh, low carbohydrate diet. So, so that, it's not quite ketogenic. It's a high protein, more like a, more like your typical Atkins meal. Yeah, it kind of is. And, uh, so these poor people, I mean, these are people who are morbidly obese, who are, you know, over 400 pounds, uh, in weight. There's, oh. uh, one, one woman who's, uh, uh, 150 kilograms. So she's, yeah, uh, up, up at that level. So, you know, um, uh, she used to be 330 pounds, I guess, doing the math in my head. So, you know, it's a horrible th thing that these poor people are going through. But mm. if they only understood, if these, this professor that's running this clinic and the weight loss surgeon there that, who's a, fa who's a brother of a famous uh, TV producer in Australia, yeah. uh, if they only understood that obesity is a, de is a derangement of, of the endocrine system, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd be able to, help yeah. thousands of people but and, and more accurately obesity is a symptom of a dysregulated endocrine system absolutely yeah. it's yeah. the result as is diabetes of as yeah. is diabetes yeah. yeah yeah so anyway they're they're looking at obesity being the the cause of the problem and yeah. their way of looking at it is people who are obese uh, are that way because genetically they have more hunger than people who aren't obese and so they're looking at huh. it from a calories in calories out oh man perspective Anyway, at least they're using a ketogenic diet. <laughs> well, yeah, so, but anyway, it's full of yeah. omega-6 oils and crap. Uh, which, it's horrible, yeah. It's terrible. I know. Yeah. It's horrible. What's wrong with real food, people? Yeah, exactly. A real food. So, anyway, that was my week. So, how was your week? Uh, my week was pretty good. And just to be clear, we're recording this on September 5th. So, we're, we're doing things a little bit out of order. Yeah. Uh, but I fasted for three days, basically. Mm -hmm. And came down six pounds and just crazy energy. It's just great. And then I ate like crazy in a four-hour window. You know, a mm -hmm. lot of fat, less protein than I usually do. Mm -hmm. And in the morning, I had no weight gain, which is great. And then cool. I'm going in for another three-day fast. So it right. really is like Sisyphus pushing the rock uphill. Mm -hmm. You know, you push the rock uphill when you're fasting and you put a wedge under it when you're eating so yeah. if you're feasting you're, you're putting a wedge under it you're stopping it yeah. and uh that's that's a really nice metaphor for what's happening mm -hmm. here uh i yeah. you know the the i've gotten to the point now where starting a fast is is easy 
So I don't have the, the pain most people go through when they start fasting of the first day, you know, which is you, you kind of have more hunger and stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, salt on the tongue all day long. It just is a yeah. wonderful thing. Well, your insulin, your fasted insulin is lower than mine. And so uh, for me, if the first day of a fast is pretty awful, and then mm. uh, the second day, everything all starts uh, being wonderful. And, you know, I have yeah. a, an abundance of energy. And, you know, that's where things all get a lot better. But for you, because your insulin, your fasted insulin is lower, you have more access to adipose uh, uh, stores of fat. Um, yep early on in the process. So it, it just goes to show you, we're, we're all different. We all have unique biochemistries and right. we need to find out what, what actually works for us. Exactly. So this is the point in the show where we give away a two keto dudes mug and the mug says, keep calm and keto on. That's the two keto dudes mantra. Yep. And today's winner is none other than wait for it. Wait for it. I'm waiting. Bruce Winters. Well done, Bruce. <laughs> yeah. Golf clap for you. Yeah. <laughs> to quote a Congratulations. phrase. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, we'll be sending that right out to you, Bruce. Thank you for listening. And Bruce won that because he signed up to the Two Keto Dudes fan club, didn't he? That's right. He went to fanclub.twoketo.com. He answered literally five questions and mm-hmm. was put in the pool to win a mug on every show and sometimes we give away other stuff other than coffee mugs Mm. today we're giving away a coffee mug yeah and if you want to get a coffee mug and you can't wait to for your name to come up in the lotto uh you can always go to gear.2keto.com and uh you can buy that stuff that's right we got shirts and other junk there all right enough about that we need to talk to Siobhan. And yes, that's how you pronounce her name, Siobhan Huggins. Mm-hmm. Um, before I introduce her, I want to say that she has written this amazing blog post, which Dave Feldman has uh, graciously hosted on his blog yeah. at cholesterolcode.com. Mm. And we will provide a link in the show notes directly to this blog post that you can read it. And uh, she's here to discuss what she talked about. But let me give her a formal introduction. Siobhan works at the help desk of an IT company working on PowerShell scripts and other techie things like that. And <laughs> at KetoFest 2017, Siobhan started down the rabbit hole of LDL research after talking to Dave Feldman. Her citizen scientist kicked into high gear and she hit the books hard trying to understand how the mechanics of the lipid system works. So be prepared to geek out, folks. Welcome, Siobhan. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. That's great. Uh, I read with wanton abandon your your premier blog post, <laughs> which you, it's really obvious that you're you're taking this seriously and and digging into stuff that I haven't read before. And quite frankly, I want to uh, just prepare everybody. And I'm going to be the acronym police because <laughs> there's a lot of technical stuff in, in what you write. Um, but right. let's just start at the beginning. When you, know, when you came to Keto Fest, what was that experience like and, and what got you started? So honestly, it was amazing just being surrounded by people I could just genuinely geek out with. Um, obviously, the big one was Dave Feldman. I did bug him quite a lot. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I went up to him over and over again, just kind of asking general stuff, you know, tell me about HDL, tell me about LDL. Mm. Uh, Part of the reason I did that is because I do like him to kind of like the high school teacher you had where they're super into the topic um, and that passion just spills over. Yeah. Yeah when they talk about it. So it's fun to watch. Mm. I've never heard Dave talk about anything else, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both software engineers. We yeah. never once have talked about link yeah. or, uh, you know, you think he'd have a conversation, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So a lot of it was just listening to him speak for a while. And then he did something really, truly horrible, Uh-oh. which he's, he speculated out loud about something he wasn't sure about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, basically two main things. One of which is, he said he speculated that um, LDL did not crash into the artery wall and then oxidize, which is what you hear a lot. Yeah. Right. But rather, it oxidizes uh, while in the bloodstream and then kind of crashes and hangs out there because it's safer. Mm-hmm. And the oxidation is sort of like 
caused by blood sugar, isn't it? Or is that the hypothesis? Um, there are actually a whole lot of different factors to oxidation. Cool. Um, I think I touched on them a little bit in the blog post. Yeah. Um, one of them is glycation, so blood sugar. Mm -hmm. Another one is um, some stuff you ingest when you smoke will oxidize mm. LDL. Mm -hmm. um, it can also be oxidized just kind of like leaving a shovel out in the rain just as a product of environment if it's there too long. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then the big one would also be reactive oxygen species. Yeah. Right. Free radicals. Right, free radicals. And those can be produced either inside, inside the body as an immune response. Mm -hmm. And they can also be from outside, again, from like smoking, from omega-6 fatty acids and all that stuff. Mm. Um, so, yeah. yeah. There's like this whole range of things that can oxidize LDL. And it's kind of nuts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so he basically left it open for you to 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 go down that rabbit hole he's like right. i'm not sure of this but here's my hunch <laughs> red drag to a bull right <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah it's right <laughs> and then the other thing was he also speculated that the process of uh heart disease of this plaque accumulation is actually originally a beneficial process that kind of gets derailed somewhere down the line mm. yeah that's yeah. What I understood in talking to Ivor Cummins, who says mm -hmm. that, you know, calcium or plaque, pla calcium actually, is is your body's response to sort of shore up. Uh, and I think he used those words, shore up. In other words, reinforce or, or, or strengthen the artery wall when it becomes weak, right? Right. And that's kind of also what I've seen. But also not only that, but the process of uh, the formation of these foam cells uh, Dave kind of speculated that all of that was beneficial as well. Hmm. And it was only kind of when it reached this critical mass that it sort of started to break down. Uh, so that's originally what I started looking into, just kind of trying to understand exactly what the mechanisms are. Because you can speculate whether something is beneficial or not, but once you understand exactly what it's doing, it's a lot easier to say, okay, yeah, maybe... <laughs> Maybe mm. we kind of do need this in place. Mm. Yeah. So I, I do want to geek out on this a bit, uh, Shimon, but before we do, can we just sort of define a few acronyms? Because there are uh, several key uh, components to to lipidology that people may or may not know what they mean. Sure thing. I was just an open-ended question. No. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Let's see. I mean, uh, LDL means low density lipoprotein. It can refer to a specific stage, also called LDL, or it can refer to all of the low density lipoproteins, like mm. pylomicrons and, um, uh. VLDLs, IDLs. Yeah. VLDL, yeah. IDL. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. I also use the term SR a lot in the article, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, that stands for scavenger receptors. Right. There are about nine different families of scavenger receptors. In that article, I'm specifically talking about the ones that will recognize modified LDL. So the LDL that has been changed in some way. Um, okay. They'll also recognize bacteria and viruses and uh, all sorts of stuff. And so where are those scavenger receptors? Um, the scavenger receptors can actually be expressed in different places. There are some in your liver. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, the ones that I am referring to there are specifically the ones in the endothelial wall. So the wall of your artery will right. express scavenger receptors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that is actually one thing I found quite interesting because it does kind of contradict the LDL crashing into the wall. It sure does. Mm. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. if the artery wall is actively going out and seeking out modified LDL, then that would obviously mean that there's some functional reason for that to, to be preserved. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, what I found myself thinking a lot is if this is just some accident, if it's a happenstance not supposed to happen, yeah. then why are there such specific pathways to get from point A to point B right. all along this way? Hmm. And even, like, redundancy, because there's, like, at least two different scavenger receptors I can think of off the top of my head that will recognize modified LDL mm -hmm. and kind of like a traffic cop say, hey, your license plate is flagged, you got to pull over, <laughs> <laughs> because it's not safe for you to be there. Right. 
Um, so redundancy just screams to me, you know, that there's some reason that this is set up this way. Yeah. Yeah. So the foam cells uh, appear, the scavengers, now n where do microphages come in? These are a particular type of uh, scavenger? No, uh, macrophages are actually uh, kind of like their own thing. Um, they start out as monocytes, and they okay. crawl along the endothelial wall. Yeah, they literally crawl, don't they? <laughs> yeah, they do. <laughs> um, so they'll crawl along the endothelial wall, and, I mean, they're basically everywhere. And okay. they keep an eye on things. Um, once they spot, like, bacteria or virus or modified LDL then they will go into this phase of being a macrophage, which will engulf this particle, this hmm. dangerous particle, mm -hmm. and it will start all of these different responses. It can produce reactive oxygen species. Hmm. Um, I speculate that that's to actually kill the bacteria if it needs to. Right. It will start um, an inflammatory response. Um, also an immune response, but also I found recently a signaling response. Mm. Um, and it will take in the modified LDL for one, and it'll split it up into different parts, uh, the cholesterol, for example, and it'll store it in these foam cells, kind of push it off to the side and put it somewhere it can store it until everything is all sorted out. So these are like vesicles that are being filled with the cholesterol? Inside the f cell? Right. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the foam cells, from what I understand it, are actually macrophages that are engorged with cholesterol. Ah. Hmm. And part of this can be healthy cholesterol, which mm -hmm. will be taken out later and recycled. Very thrifty process. Yeah. Or it will be, uh, for example, like oxysterol, mm -hmm. oxidized cholesterol, that will be taken by HDL and kind of dumped out the back door. Um transformed into bile salts and disposed of. Uh, so that's the garbage truck analogy. The HDL's coming along and just taking all of the uh, old and decrepit stuff and taking, uh, yeah, exporting it off to be dumped out in bile, right? Correct. Yeah. As you're describing this, I'm thinking about like the scene of an accident on the highway. It's a pretty good analogy. I mean, I don't know about you know, who is the EMTs, but certainly we know who the patient is. Um, oh, well, yeah, I could tell you who the EMTs are. That would be the healthy LDL that's pulled in by the LDL receptors in case there's any cell repair that needs to be done. Um, so EMTs would be LDL. Um, the HDL would be... Maybe the ambulance? Disposal. Uh, not exactly ambulance. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's the maintenance workers coming to clear yeah, all the of the... Yeah, the maintenance workers. HDL would be maintenance workers. Pulling the okay. broken cars off the road. Right. <laughs> they clean up anything that needs to be disposed of, and they also take in stuff that can be recycled and reused again. Mm -hmm. um, and that is one thing I found really, really interesting, is just the level of, you know, we can't dump out anything that can be reused again. Right. So this, all this healthy cholesterol that was taken off of the modified LDL that wasn't damaged, we're going to take that, ship it out to the liver. Uh, we also use HDL for that, and we repackage it up and put it up in brand sparkling new LDL, ready for use again. Nice. Mm. So it's like a tow truck. The HDL is like the tow truck. Comes along, yeah. pulls the car, and <laughs> takes it to yeah, the tow truck. I, I'm I'm so loving this analogy. Yeah. yeah. So it takes it to be reclaimed. Right. The HDL can be likened to a tow truck mm -hmm. where it'll take the completely dead stuff to yeah. the junkyard yeah. or the stuff that can be repaired over to the repair shop. Yeah. So where do the scavenger receptors, the SRs, come in after this uh, inflammation starts? Before. Oh, okay. uh, so what will actually happen is um, so particles that will be recognized by scavenger receptors will get close enough to the artery wall, generally at like bend points. Hmm. And there will usually be, like, a couple scavenger receptors around. Mm -hmm. And as soon as a scavenger receptor recognizes that there's this bad guy around, it'll start expressing more and more scavenger receptors and start ah. catching them. <laughs> so, basically, mm. pulling these guys over to the side of the road. Mm. So, ah, I wouldn't cop exactly... Cars. Yes, traffic <laughs> cops. <Yeah. laughs> they see you speeding. They see you with the taillight out. You, they pull you over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, so that's why I don't really liken it to 
the scene of an accident exactly because it's not an accident. It's actually yeah. pretty finely controlled. Okay. So the scavenger receptors are able to recognize these uh, modified LDL, but not the native healthy LDL. Native healthy LDL passes right on by. It's following all the laws, no problem. Mm -hmm. The modified LDL, the bacteria, the viruses, all of that will get pulled over, and then uh, scavenger receptors will keep upregulating their expression. More of them will be made. Hmm. Just to catch more and more. So they do a pile on. Basically, one yeah. one cop <laughs> notices some uh, bad guys, some bad hombres on the road, and calls in his buddies, and <laughs> and all of a sudden you have <laughs> hundreds of them looking after bad hombres. Right. <laughs> right. I get it. <laughs> right. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they will generally conglomerate in this area uh, where there's a high amount of bad particles. Um, and they'll just start pulling them in. And one thing I often saw pointed out in the literature mm -hmm. is that scavenger receptors are not down-regulated like uh, LDL receptors are, okay. which means that they'll just keep pulling stuff in. No matter how much they bring in, they'll just keep doing it until ah. basically everything is gone. Um, okay. As opposed to the LDL receptor which is more finely regulated. It will down-regulate if, if there's a lot of cholesterol in the cell already. It'll kind of be like, okay, that's enough. Mm -hmm. and shut off. Scavenger receptors do not do that. Interesting. So the scavenger receptors uh, form, and they pull in more LDL, and they store them in these, right. in these uh, pools that you were talking about? Yeah, the lipid pools. Yep, the foam cells. Okay. And so what what happens next? Um so I kind of call that like the quarantine zone. Um and one thing I was reading pretty recently actually is the clearance of these foam cells. HDL will take the stuff out again and put it away like we were talking about. Um that is actually put off until the end of the inflammatory response. Mm. Oh. Um so another reason we can call that a quarantine zone is this stuff is taken in, it's sorted out, good, bad, we need to throw that out, we'll keep that. Mm -hmm. Bacteria and viruses will be neutralized, killed, the scene will be sterilized, and then after everything is sorted away, and after everything is kind of taken care of and cleaned up, then the HDL will come, you know, it's classified as safe, we can start cleaning up now. Mm. So until then, Everything is stored in these foam cells, and like I said, the scavenger receptors are never down-regulated, so they keep pulling stuff in. Wow. Now, the thing to take note is that the oxysterol, the oxidized cholesterol mm -hmm. that collects, yeah. if too much of that accumulates, which, I mean, according to how long it takes to actually have a heart attack is quite a long time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the higher the level, the more toxicity there is. Um, I mean, this is damaged stuff. It's basically radioactive waste that's, you know, <laughs> we're trying to store it. We're trying yeah. to store it safely. But, um, I mean, after a certain point, this oxysterol starts to kill the macrophages. Okay. And the macrophages will release particles that will damage the plaque. So it'll start thinning the plaque. And you can also have mechanical damage on the other side of the plaque that thins it from the other side. Mm. And that's where we start to see issues. That's when plaques break off and, and cause damage. Correct. And how does the plaque form in the first place? Um, so the plaque forms as a process of kind of shifting around these smooth muscle cells, the muscle cells that uh, line mm. the artery wall, Yeah. Um, as a process of kind of putting these lipid engorged macrophages inside the artery wall Smooth muscle cells will migrate to cover them up from the other side to kind of form a wall between it and the bloodstream. Wow. Because we really don't want this stuff in the bloodstream. It's yeah, why right. it's being taken out in the first place. Mm. So what's really interesting to me is, um, you know, under what circumstances does this, uh, does this process work? Like, you know, obviously the process was designed to work. Like insulin's job is to clear sugar out of the blood because it's more dangerous in the blood than it is in fat cells 
you know, the energy from right. the sugar. But, and so I, you, you sort of can see the analogy here. <laughs> right. But, but so, what, under what situation does it work correctly? Um, I mean, the snarky reply to that would be every single day you're alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> it's continually going. Because, right, it's mm. continually going. And 99% of the time, it works perfectly fine. Mm. We can even look at kids and see they have these fatty streaks, this first step of this process. Yeah. Okay. And it'll either stay the same or it'll kind of clear up and go away as they grow older. So, really, it's every single day that this is occurring in working i got it so so let's let's ask the antithesis of that question which is under what circumstances and i think you've already answered it uh, under what circumstances is there too much for the system to handle and i think you you talked about sugar in the blood you talked about smoking and you talked about um some other some other things that i can't remember right um so the important thing to highlight with this is this is an immune response this is a response to particles that are dangerous to have in the bloodstream, pulling them out and dealing with them. Same mm. thing we do with bacteria. So the really amazing thing to think about is we can have this constant barrage of the system, you know, eating super high carb, lots of vegetable oils, smoking, and we won't see people have heart attacks until their 50s or 60s. Right. right? Which is frankly amazing because... Mm. I mean, you wouldn't see that level of resiliency in anything that we make, Not for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, really, it's just a constant barrage of an immune process over the course of decades until it actually starts to break down. The chronic accumulation. Right. Yeah. A chronic condition of always being on high alert. No Got rest it. for, you know, 50 years. You know what's interesting to me about this is that we're starting to see blood vessels as being an organ that's responsible for the filtration of the blood. They're not just a passive conduit for uh, mm. to, to move liquids through the body, but they're 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 actively involved in it. And we're kind of seeing the same thing with the fat cells. Fat cells have become an organ now that they're they've always been an endocrine organ, but you know we're seeing more. Uh, control being um, shipped from the fat cells to the rest of the body and driving everything, and it's 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 more of a holistic view of all of these organs working together rather than sort of organs connected by sort of conduits of veins that do very little. Right. Why only have you know an artery, an artery wall, do one thing of containing all this stuff, yeah. as opposed to actually pulling its own weight? Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it does make sense this this view uh, and and also what it highlights is that conventional wisdom is to look at a particular particle and say that shouldn't be there. You know, we need to do everything we can do uh, you know, behavior wise to get that stuff out of your blood because that one particle is its mere existence is a problem. Right. Um, I think that is one thing people can kind of misunderstand with what I'm saying. I'm not saying the modified LDL in itself is an issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you think about it, like, what's the alternative, really? Right. Um, a lot of this oxidation is coming from reacting to these free radicals. Mm -hmm. And if the LDL doesn't kind of sacrifice its hydrogen to this free radical, then something else is going to do it instead. Sure. And we can see that. Uh, when the system gets overwhelmed, LDL can no longer keep up with it, and reactive oxygen species start to steal hydrogen from other particles instead, mm. like uh, smooth muscle cells. Mm. And when that happens, the smooth muscle cell will actually grow in a way that is very disfigured and unhealthy, and that is a lot harder to fix compared to LDL. Right. Uh -huh. So really, the modified LDL is kind of what, how it's supposed to be handled. We have very good clearance mechanisms for it. We know how to handle it. Mm. Um, and generally, like, day-to-day -day works perfectly fine. It's, um, it's kind of like the bodyguard jumping in front of the president. You know, to take the bullet. It's, <laughs> right. It's because, you yeah. know, we, we, we've got plenty of bodyguards and we can make more if we need them and we know how to look after them and to deal with them. And, you know, th and, they, and they take the bullet, basically, whereas if, you know. Right. Yeah. And that is one interesting thing that I didn't mention in, in the article um, because I actually didn't hear about it until 
yesterday. Um, Whoa. Okay, <laughs> this is new information, people. This is a scoop. Fresh scoop. Right. <laughs> exclusive. Exclusive, mm. just for you guys. Right. So I was actually reading about how these uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is kind of these regulators of the inflammatory process, mm-hmm. one I hear mentioned very frequently is uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. TNF-alpha-1, <laughs> yep. TNF-alpha-1. Um, so that, along with two others... Uh, two other pro-inflammatory cytokines will actually be recognized by the liver. And in response, the liver will upregulate VLDL. Ah, nice. So we can see this on a broad scope of things. When we get an infection or an injury, LDL will go up. We make more LDL. But there is actually a specific process for that. When inflammation occurs, Mm -hmm. the liver will see these and they'll say, oh, we better start making more. Interesting. Yeah. There are two phases to that in the paper that I was reading. Phase number one is actually a release of uh, fatty acids from the adipose tissue, from Mm. the fat cells. Right. And that will upregulate LDL. Mm -hmm. But also, um, after that phase one has gone on for a little while, it'll switch over to phase two. So phase one had these very triglyceride-rich VLDL. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And phase two has uh, something you might have heard of pretty frequently, which is the small dense LDL. Sure. So these are produced during the phase two inflammatory response, where we're not really getting a lot of triglycerides with it, but the uh, apolipoprotein B, which defines LDL a little bit, it's on every single one of them, uh, the liver will start producing more and more of those, but it won't fill them up with... um, additional triglyceride, really. So it makes them very small and dense. And I speculate that these are kind of disposable bodyguards. A huge wide net is thrown out, (laughs) and everything is caught that it can Mm. in reaction to this inflammatory event. And we know, just to connect the low-carb diet here, we know that eating low-carb reduces the amount of small, dense lipoproteins, doesn't it? Correct. I believe those are LDL that just stay around for too long in the system. They're not cleared quickly. Whereas what Siobhan is talking about is uh, small, uh, basically just an ApoB and some phospholipids set out to to take up uh, uh, triglycerides and cholesterol. It's just absolutely brilliant how this stuff works like a machine. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's better than any machine we could possibly build. Right. Because you could spend months, <laughs> basically what I've been doing, just months looking at one process and you will still not understand it. Mm. I think it's remarkable yeah. that, that you've come at this from a research point of view because Dave's uh, inspired you to, to go down the rabbit hole to satisfy your own curiosity because he was not forthcoming because, frankly, he didn't know the full story. And you've built this article. I mean, you have 38 citations in this article. <laughs> you, yeah. you have, I mean, if anybody wants to know, uh, all the, uh, basically uh, what you've learned in the process of what, two months of researching this thing, you've got laid out every single textbook and paper that they need to look at to be able to, uh, follow along with you, right? Right. Um, and I, I mean, I'm still learning stuff along the way. Like I said, I learned something new last night, and I'll probably learn something new tomorrow. Mm. Um, and that's why I hope to turn it into this full-fledged series, because as I continue to learn about this stuff, I want to share it with you guys. Yeah. Um, because I think the more people that understand the mechanisms of all this stuff, the less we can see it as this scary thing that's trying to kill us. And the more we can appreciate it as a system that our body has... To yeah. really try very hard to keep us alive. Yeah. You know, it, the the more you go down this rabbit hole, the more you realize how hard it is just to have an armchair conversation with your doctor about cholesterol. Right. And I have attempted once. <laughs> he kind of brushed me off. We debated about the Framingham study. Um, yeah. He said, uh, mm. statins will reduce your risk of um, heart disease, a heart event by 30%. And I said... That's relative, not absolute. <laughs> he was uh, not amused. No, I'll bet. <laughs> well, you know, when you when you say, show me the science to support that, they really can't, you know, because it doesn't exist. Right. Hmm. 
Wow. So what's next for you? What are you, what are you researching next? I mean, I guess this thing that you learned yesterday has got you in a tailspin, right? <laughs> or a headspin, <laughs> right. maybe. <laughs> um, I mean, I had already known that, like I said, LDL will go up during an infection, but seeing the actual mechanisms for it is frankly amazing. Hmm. Um, I am working on part two of the blog series, um, and that will focus on actually what you asked earlier. What causes this modification of right. LDL? Um, what do we actually see the scavenger receptors recognizing? Hmm. And I will touch a little bit on what exactly can influence that. Like I said, omega-6 fatty acids. Right. Um, just a little bit. Um, I think really what I most often tell people is if you want to see a macro view, Go look at the stuff that Ivor Cummins is doing. He covers it really well. Yes. If you want a really in-depth, deep dive, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, that's great, Siobhan. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. And and please, let's keep in touch and maybe even uh, do some more podcasts about this. Yeah, no problem. I'd love to. All right. We're just Wow, that's fascinating stuff. And I'm really glad there are people out there like Siobhan who just sort of make it easy for us lay people to understand what's really going on. Yeah, she's really blazing a path and she's leaving markers all the way along of where she got her information from so that we can follow her. And it certainly makes it a lot easier for the rest of us to uh, to travel the same terrain. Yeah. And we really only scratched the surface of the topic there. Um, yeah. you know, Sh- Siobhan has done a, a really good expose on Dave Feldman's site. And uh, I recommend that uh, you follow that. She will probably have a series of blog posts there. So yeah. if you're interested in this topic and interested in how the lipid system works from the point of view of somebody who's gone through a lot of the research literature to try and work it all out and provide a synthesis, I'd I'd follow her blog post so that you can get there at plaque.2keto.com. That's P-L-A-Q-U-E dot 2keto.com. So, Richard, are you hungry? I am a little bit hungry. I think it might be time for some... Recipes! <laughs> awesome. I'm going to go first because mine's simple. Go for it. I've talked about making bacon in the oven before, but I never really gave the recipe, and we certainly don't have a blog post about it. But mm-hmm. it, it's so easy um, and so effective based on, you know, the, a few factors. So here's the deal. Making bacon in the oven is a superior method to cooking bacon because a lot of the fat stays on the bacon. It doesn't yeah. sort of drain away. And it has this magical, crispy quality to it. You know, like a Krispy Kreme donut? It's crispy (laughs) because of the fat. Yeah. Well, when you make bacon on a griddle or in a fry pan, it sort of dries out and a lot of the fat just goes away. But when you make it on parchment paper in the oven, it sort of stays with the bacon. Mm. It stays in situ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's what you do. You Mm -hmm. use cookie sheets and parchment paper. Parchment paper is a wonderful thing, as you know. Yeah. So just get a sheet of parchment paper, put it on a cookie sheet. You need to preheat the oven to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is how much Celsius? 300 Fahrenheit? That's roughly 150 Celsius. Nice. Now, I like to cut my bacon strips in half. Okay. And it's up to you, but I I find them more cracker-like when they're a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. And if they're big, they don't fit on sandwiches and all of that stuff. So Yeah. And it's easier to cut them before they're cooked. Right. So I just cut them in half. And yes, I did say sandwiches. I use bread from Fox Hill Kitchens, which you can get at Mm bread.2keto.com. All right. So you preheat the oven to 300. You basically cut the strips in half and put them on the sheet. You can make two sheets, three sheets at a time, however many racks you have. And basically just keep an eye on them after 15 minutes. There's no need to flip them if you're only at 300 degrees because they don't burn. They It, it just sort of cooks at that perfect temperature where they just come out and they're done. Nice. So 15 to 20 minutes is really all you need. And uh, mm. this is stuff that you can do ahead of time, right? And, and you know, I like to make bacon, put it in yep. a Ziploc bag, put it in the fridge. And then mm-hmm. when I'm peckish, 
I have bacon and I can either yeah. <laughs> reheat it in a fry pan when I'm making eggs and bacon or in a mm -hmm. fry pan when I'm making hamburgers or whatever, uh, or just take it out and spread some cream cheese or some brie on it. Mm, mm, yum. Mm, <laughs> yum. <laughs> That's it, man. What do you got? So I've got an ice cream recipe and this is actually one that I got from Siobhan. No kidding. Yeah. And this recipe starts with two Ziploc bags. We want a, a big bag and a small bag. The bigger one we want to fill with, um, it's going to be a half gallon sized bag, about two liter sized bag. And we're going to half fill it with ice cubes. And then we're going to add to that, uh, about a quarter of a cup of salt. And the mm. salt in the ice cubes will, will allow the ice to, to reach a lower temperature. And that will, right. and we're going to put the smaller bag inside the larger bag. We're going to put the cream and, uh, flavorings inside the smaller bag and we're going to shake it up. And so we're huh. going to add pr probably, uh, in, in the smaller container, we're probably going to add maybe a cup of cream and a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of swerve for flavoring or, or sweetener. whatever sweetener you yeah. prefer. Yeah. And add a pinch of salt as well, which mm. also helps to, um, helps to make the sweetness, uh, stronger, surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And then taste it and get it to the right taste. First, and then you close the small bag, remove some of the air out of the top of it. So you, you almost yeah. close it fully. You leave a little gap and then you squeeze the bag down until the liquid comes almost to the top of the ziplock. And then you pull the, the ziplock closed. And that is going to give you a bag with just the ice cream mixture inside. Nice. And then what you do is you put the small bag inside the larger bag. And then you fill the large bag with more ice cubes. It doesn't have to be entirely full, but you just want the small bag to be completely surrounded by ice. And yeah. then you uh, close the large bag tightly, and you can remove as much air as you can using the same technique. And now do you play football with it? <laughs> <laughs> you kind of do. You wrap it in a towel, like a, a dishcloth. And okay. you need the towel because the plastic bags would get really cold and, right. and moist, and they could fall out of your, your, your grip. And then you shake it for like uh, five minutes. And no kidding. You yeah, that's it. And it's a simple recipe. And what comes out is, um, it's ice cream. I mean, it, 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 it has a texture of ice cream and it takes about five minutes to make. So, you know, if you're ever desperate, chuck it over some berries or whatever. Yeah, that is so cool. Do you think making an on glaze is going to work in this, uh, in this way? In other words, if you, yeah. you know, heat up egg yolks and cream and sugar and get it to that stage where it coats the back of a spoon and then cool it down. Um, yes. which is your standard custard ice cream. Do you think yeah. that would work in this uh, in this way? I totally think it would. What we're talking about here is iced cream, you know, yeah. cream that is iced, which right. is if you're going to make it in five minutes, it's, you, you make it on glaze, it's going to, ta it's going to sure. take probably 15 minutes just to, just to get the, 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 um, the double broiler set up and all of the, all of the rigmarole. Wow. Uh, but I would say that I love a custard that's made into an ice cream. That is yeah, a traditional form of ice cream. And so I am I might try both and just do yeah, a, I'm gonna a, try both an myself. A B comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds so that's good. my recipe. Mm. Awesome. Well, that's a show. I personally enjoyed this one. We hope you did too. Yeah. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com. Or post it on their website. And you can follow us on Twitter at 2KetoDudes, on Instagram at 2KetoDudes, and make sure to use the hashtag 2KetoDudes. <laughs> That's a lot of 2KetoDudes. It's a lot of 2KetoDudes. And of course, if you want to f join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum.2keto.com. And if you so swag is your fancy t shirts, coffee mugs, and junk like mm -hmm. that, head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting that swag for free, join the Two Keto Dudes fan club. You'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our podcasts, and yes, I said podcasts. Yeah. Because we are now going to be making more of them than just Two Keto mm -hmm. Dudes and our forums. Make a pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. Or just hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or just go to donate.2keto.com. And you can also see our podcast and other videos like the Keto Fest videos on mm. YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave us a review on iTunes. Definitely. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC. 
and produced by Pwop Productions, providing audio, video, and podcast production services since 2002. Online at pwop.com. Well, keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Kyle. All right, and we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.